Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Mark Zeller, and I head up design for Fisher Price up in East Aurora. Definitely not a startup, but it was a startup 85 years ago. Um, but um, because we're not a startup, we're always looking at ways that we have to make ourselves relevant to new consumers, and that's what I'm going to touch upon a little bit tonight, um, as well as a, a little bit about our process as well. Um, being a toy designer for me has been a really exciting career. I think it does, what makes toy design exciting is the fact that you're always working on something kind of new and different. Um, you can be working on an RC car, you feel like a hotshot car designer, you could be designing a, a toy phone for an infant, you feel like you're dabbling into consumer electronics. A dollhouse, you feel like an architect, you, a doll, you feel like you're, you're a fashion designer, but in a very small and cute way. So it's a very exciting career, I recommend it. Um, I always get asked what's the favorite toy that I ever designed and I don't know that it's this this toy exactly but this is the point where I re remember realizing I loved my career because I was given the assignment at Hasbro to design the 85th anniversary Lincoln Log set and what a classic brand that is but every day I would come in put my backpack down sit on the floor for a month and play with Lincoln Logs. Then my boss would come in and she'd sit down on the floor and she'd play with Lincoln Logs. That's where I realized I found my calling and that people would actually pay me to do this, which was really exciting. Um, but Fisher Price, Fisher Price, I mentioned it's an 85-year-old brand. It was, um, it was a startup by Herm Fisher. Um, he started in, in East Aurora, New York, and it was really about transforming the toy industry at that point. It was mass production, it was getting into toys that had a strong construction, um, but what was really new and that he wanted to incorporate in all of his toys was this, this action. So up to that point, he really wanted to have an element of magic or intrigue into the physical toy that would delight and engage a child. And so the very first toy, there were 16 toys taken to New York Toy Fair in 1931. Dr. Doodle was the very first toy um, you pulled and his little bill quacked along and that was an example of, of the what was you know excitement back in 1931 but um, there was always an element of innovation incorporating something new into the product 1950 was in the 50s weirds when they introduced plastic and plastic was really about that durability message that was a part of the original intent of Fisher Price and it was also a way of incorporating more color into the product as well and then, of course, 1960s, I don't know, I think everybody had a Rocka stack. There's 45 million out there, so somebody must have had it. Very iconic product. 70s, um, we developed something known as um, Play Family, which later became Little People, but it was actually cool because it was bringing dollhouse play to both genders and creating different environments that uh, made that, uh, that um, great for kids and built their imaginations as well. And then 1990 was another insight that said, you know, kids love action figures. They're not easy for them to play with. Sometimes the themes are not appropriate. We created uh, big chunky action figures for kids with big feet, made them stable, allowed them to stand. Became really important around 9-11. They were all based on rescue themes. And um, it was a very exciting time on action figures, Fisher Price. Then in the 2000s, we got connected, and connected meant a cord going from your toy to your TV set back then. But what I'm going to talk about really is, you know, how that made us an 84-year-old brand. How do you make it relevant, though? We're in 150 countries, which means we're approximately translating our toys in 49 different languages. Two billion dollar brand. And we really are. We're a child development company for young families. And that really goes back to the notion that every parent kind of wants to be a better parent than the parent that they had. They want to provide their child with the best possible start. And that is really a global message that everybody, that everybody understands. So one of the big important features for us, and I think it sets us out from the competition too, is the culture of observation. So we actually have 3,500 children come through our play lab a year, and we're testing 1,200 different products. And for us, 
that can be user experience on something that's screen related. It can be a foam core model of a toy. It can be a rendering. Do you like pirates or do you like shark pirates? I mean, it's, it's, it's a wide gamut of things that we test with kids. 182,000 kids have come through our play lab since 1961. So it, what's really amazing to me, even 25 years of designing toys, you will still observe children play with your toys and find out they did something you didn't expect them to do. Um, this next item is an example of this. This actually came as an invention on the outside. It was pitched to us as an infant toy. We were a little suspect. We took it into our play lab. We found that two three-year-olds loved playing. They couldn't stop playing with it. It's just little magnet um, wheels that you put on, we call them yo rollers, that you can reconfigure this set and discover how gravity works. Take a look. That's Booby launched, I think, sometime this summer. Um, but for us, you know, it's really, when looking for a new consumer, it's, it's all about the inspiration that we try to create at Fisher Price. And that also involves a collaborative culture, new things that we're trying as well. And then ultimately leading to new products that provide solutions for today's parents. So this is where we're located, and we're about a half hour outside of Niagara Falls, and that's what it, I don't know what it looks like now, but that's what it looks like in the heart of the winter. Um, they expect it to thaw sometime in May, and um, it's brutal. If you thought you had a bad winter in New York, you don't know anything. Um, it's a small town, about 6,000 people, so it's really critical that we get out of those four walls, and, and I think that doesn't, really doesn't matter where you're located. If you only think you're as good as the people in the room, then, then you're, you, you really need to get out. So what we do is we, we, um, we subscribe to a lot of these trending forecasting sites. I'm sure you're familiar with some of them. Two of my favorites are Fashion Snoops, and they're aggregating, um, they're aggregating runway and retail, and they're predicting 18 months out, which is critical for us. Um, and then also Material Connections. I don't know if anybody has been to Material Connections. It's a wonderful place with over 5,000 materials in their library. That it's a wonderful place to spend some time. It's actually um, located in Midtown, but they have locations all over the world. So for us, they're informing some of the fashion prints that we're looking at. The character elements, characters are really important to us at Fisher Price. Um, they're kind of an introduction to to. Um, to, to live um, people in some ways because they're not, they don't have gender, they don't have um, race involved, they're just, they're an introduction to, to people for, for little infants. And then of course, color form and materials. So this is what kind of informs us for what we're gonna be putting into our products in terms of the graphic design. So for us, bright and bold, gender neutral, pops off of the white that we use a lot in our products. Then also, it's something that we can flex for girl-directed products if a parent is interested in that. And then also for us, we're also inspired by what's happening in trends and home decor as well. Because if you think of some of the things we develop, they're rather large and substantial, and they take up a lot of room in your place. So you better like looking at it for as long as it's in your, in your house. So. We also reach out, we do a lot of student um, collaborations. So this is something that we did with the Domus Academy. Domus Academy is in Milan. It's one of the top rated design schools. It's all um, master's degree program, but this was something that we did with our tube benders. And the tube benders are some of the, thing, the materials we use for some of our baby gear that supp um, provide support for, for our sleepers and so forth. So really inspiring work. We also had them work on high chair solutions from, from rockers all the way to sit-up seats. 
and then also um, rockers and swings as well. So not saying that this is something that we're going to come out with, but we're always going out there years ahead to inform and inspire the designers that we have. And then the collaborative culture that we're trying to instill as well. So that can be external and internal. We reach out to Continuum, which is a innovation and design firm with offices all around the world. And we ask them really to, I don't know, pressure test where we are in the design of our products and making sure that we are speaking to a new consumer. So what they really did was help us to create a guide that we can use with all the designers to uh, make sure that we're speaking some of the same, same design language with really clean, basic, simple geometric forms, pure transitions. So this is kind of what is happening in some of the products that are launching now. So we've kind of, you look on the, the outside, you've got the laptop and the cell phone, and which are kind of cartoonish caricatures of, of those items. And we're trying to be inspired more by consumer electronics that are actually out there with cleaner and simpler forms. Some of the rockers I was just talking about with the tube forms as well. You know, it almost looks like a piece of lawn furniture meets, I don't know, other kind of uh, elderly equipment. But now we're trying to make those forms out of plastic so you can get more of a sculptural feel to them. And the form actually suggests the function of the rocking as well. And again, some of the graphics that we feel are much more current than if you look at in, in, in the left. And then even the classic xylophone, looking into modifying that to give it an expression, a gesture that kind of implies that it's dancing to the music that it's creating. And now that we've spent a lot of time looking at our industrial design and our form, we're looking at now the consumer touch points and the user experience of what I'm calling you know, the switch panels. What you see here is you know, looking at the softness of the materials, the patterns, how they connect to the form. And then on the far right is actually looking at the switches and what that feels like. We all know what it feels great when we touch a good switch on something that's of a high quality product. And we got to make sure that, that uh, we're, we're going in that direction. I think some of the older products, when I walked in, they kind of like felt like a blender from you know, the 80s. I'm not denigrating it. There's nobody but my team here, right? Um, but we're trying to really amp up um, you show the image of the nest, and that's an amazing product as well. But looking at technology that can really make sure that our interface with the consumer is as high tech and satisfying as possible. And then speaking of, of collaboration, we have an office here in New York City, and they really focus on the character brands, those being Thomas, Nickelodeon brands, and so forth. And East Aurora, we focus on what we call the core products. So there's two sets of designers. And so they don't get to interact much. And it's probably more important for me to send the designers from my sleepy little hamlet up in the frozen tundra to the city because there's just stimulation wherever you walk in the city. And so and it's a good chance for them to meet each other. So what we did is we created um, an event last month where we actually brought designers down from East Aurora, paired them with designers in New York City, and we sent them around to 50 boutiques around New York City galleries and so forth. And they had to gather materials that they found were interesting and exciting. But then also they had to present them in a way that had applications to our business as well. So it was really an, an event to get the designers out, engaged with each other, and trend hunting for new materials. Open Mix is something we created in, um, in both campuses, really. It's, it's an, a forum for anybody that has any kind of idea that they're passionate about to present to senior management. When I say senior management, I'm talking like four or five people um, in marketing and design. And it's really kind of interesting because in a large corporation like Fisher-Price, you know, you can be passionate about, you can be a designer that's only been on the staff for a couple of years and you have a really great idea, but then it gets, well, it's got to sell for $29.99, it won't sell at, Mark, at Walmart, Target's not going to take it, and it just kind of kills that passion sometimes. And so, created a program that allowed anybody to present whatever they want. We gave them the tools and idea resume to follow, and we're actually moving forwards with some of the items that somebody just came and presented an idea. So it's, it's really exciting format. Um, 
these are examples of some, you know, a designer that felt really passionate about eco-clothing and a charitable component to some of the things we do. Looking at um, how do you make cooking more interesting for boys in terms of, and that's actually a measuring cup in a dump truck. Um, what are we doing, Fisher Price, about a green statement? You know, we seem to be a little bit nervous about making a green claim, and people feel strongly about it. Um, live was really talking about how do we use technology to live stream music into our products because there's an energy and a soul to live music that you can't capture in the chips we use. So people are really inspired by the technology and they want to share. And then we always we hand out a winner every quarter. Um, the, the people vote on the Open Mix community. It's an internal social social group, and they vote. And there's a cash prize and. And it just, it's, a, it's a really good moment to celebrate. Mixed Fair is something we also just did um, last month, and that was really about creating a Maker Fair environment inside of our campus of East Aurora. So again, this was something where you, know, you set up an idea of a party, and you're never sure if everybody's going to come or not. But we had 60 teams of people that wanted to share technologies, business opportunities, charitable ideas that they wanted to share with the rest of the company. So where Open Mix was a small, I have an idea, I want to present to senior managers. This is, I have an idea and I want to present with the entire Fisher Price company. And it was a great success. And then designing for the new consumer. So we bring all this inspiration and collaboration together. And some of the products that are launching right now as we speak is the Smart Connect Swing and also the Mobile there. But the idea is you can actually turn on and off the swing with your smart device. You can actually adjust the speed, the volume as well to really soothe and calm baby. Fisher Price 4 in 1 Smart Connect Cradle and Swing. Turn it on with your smartphone or tablet to soothe your baby from a safe distance. From Fisher Price, for the best possible start. <laughs> and then also for a mobile for a baby's room, because with the monitors that you have, you can hear if a baby is fussing, but if you go into the room, you can actually disturb and just create a chain of events that you don't necessarily want to happen. So it's the ability to activate. Again, products launching just now. And then it's not always just a device for the parent. We're also looking at whatever technology we can put into our toys to really um, delight and engage a baby. And this is an example of, I think, also the new form language that we're talking about um, that's very sculptural and very modern and sleek and aesthetic. But also, um, it has capacitant touch technology. So you don't really have to press a hard button. It can be more of a magical touch for the baby.
then speaking of characters and how important they are to babies, and then also combining with a little bit of EDM, a little bit of, uh, <laughs> only because we get, we get the feeling, we know that children learn through movement and when they're moving, they're engaged in learning. So this was an item that allowed them and encouraged them to get up and move, but also had a technology where to actually record um, snippets and then actually embed it into the content and the music. This is. See how we're trying to embed new technology you know is a you know moving beyond the rocket stack to really make delightful exciting toys for parents and children and that's what i got for tonight you can already imagine uh half those songs stuck in millions of parents heads <laughs> sorry <not> <laughs> Um, hey, before we jump to the q and I'm curious, who here works on a software product? Uh, raise your hand. And who works on a physical product? Okay, so mostly yeah. software people. Interesting. All right, yeah. great. Um, so let's do the Q&A. Who wants to start it up? Up here. Hello. Um, my name is Julian. I'm a French software engineer. Uh, first of all, your toys are so awesome. I think I'm going to get one for my desk at work. <laughs> Thank you. And second of all, I work for a software startup, and we release products very fast, and there's a lot of risk in that. So I'd like to know how much risk you think you take when you release a new product, a physical product. That is a really hot topic within our company. We've actually done... Um, teams that really look at risk aversion and I would say that there there has been a tendency in the past not to take a lot of risk. What I've talked about in terms of people just coming in presenting ideas, for some people that is really risky and but it also is the ability to say okay we're gonna take that item we're gonna do it we're gonna do it in nine months and we're gonna get it out to market and we are trying to be as fast as possible more than we've ever been in our past so it's actually a really exciting time at Fisher Price you know, it, it, not the time, we spend a lot of time with research, insights, testing, um, with consumers. You know, the, the critical part of, of watching kids play, we, we will always do that, but that's just intrinsic to what we do. But the risk is something that we do struggle with, and we're trying to, to take uh, the shackles off. Absolutely. Hi, um, I, I have two children, and when one, my first one was one, couldn't, was used to using touch devices. And then when I put a New York Times in front of her, she kept trying to touch the color objects. Where do you see a line between responsiveness of objects and children and ages? Responsiveness in objects and ages? Um. Well, that's why the, the testing is so important, because we are putting those items in front of kids. You know, we did launch a, a line of products a few years ago. I don't know if anybody's heard the word activity before, but it was a relationship between the screen and a physical product. So we spent a, t a lot of time looking at that. And, you know, it really did not resonate in the marketplace. Um, there is a little bit of movement towards, I mean, we're finding out the kids can't use scissors as, as well as they could anymore. Writing is, is, is tougher for them to do. So, 
As far as touch and response, I think we look at that as a physical standpoint. Like if you looked at the play space with the capacitant touch, that was a way of making it super easy for kids and translating later maybe towards screen time. But that's something we also discuss all the time in, in, internally. The screen. Hi, um, my name is Scott. I'm a designer at a startup, a first month startup. And uh, I'm also a father of a seventh month old son. And uh, could you talk about the balance between designing products that children enjoy versus products that parents want to buy because of the way they look? Or, you know, like there could be a product for a child that does amazing things, but I think it's ugly. So how do you, <laughs> how do you deal with that balance of, uh, I want this in my house versus my kid's going to love this? Well, I think, you know, up to age three, three is the point where we notice the kids ask for something. So up to that point, it's kind of like a parent's decision, and we know that design really matters, especially for, for millennials. Um, and I think it, it really speaks to, Samsung, Apple, being in the marketplace for years and good, to just being exposed to it, we know that it's, it's, it's a point of entry. It's, it's not a nice to have, it's a must have. So for the, up to that age, we really focus on that. At that point, three plus, they are watching TV, they're asking for things, it's more of their decision. And you'll notice advertising gets more kid directed at that point, but be, before that, it's really directed towards the mom and her tastes. Making you run. Hey, I'm Saul. I'm the founder of a uh, startup here in New York City working on mobile news. Um, I have a three and a half year old daughter and a 10 month old son. My three and a half year old daughter has many, many toys. And I don't know, I just find personally that like she ends up using the physical, like she'll use the iPad. 10 times the amount of the physical toy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just because it's a lot of the same over and over again, and at some point you just get bored. Mm -hmm. And I didn't necessarily see anything forthcoming that addresses that. Is that something you think you're addressing, you plan on addressing, or is it just we're SOL? It's something that we're planning on addressing. I think what the exciting thing that's out there in terms of technology is the ability to update your toys seamlessly. And that is something that I think is gonna be the next step. I mean, the toy industry has been really working with, unfortunately, the same set of chips and electronics, and that's why we are really embracing the startup community. And then looking at technologies, I think the next wave is gonna be really how do we update those toys that have always just been what they are. Yes? Do you want a mic? Or, oh, sorry. Hi, um, I'm a graphic designer and marketer. I was wondering, with the change in form, did you, I feel like a lot of the toys are very recognizable and traditional and people pass them down from generation to generation. With the change in form, it's almost like a change in branding. And did you find that your products are still recognizable to people? Or do you want to sort of rebrand in that way? I would say that we'd want to reband in that way, and I think it's, it goes beyond product. So some of the imagery that you've seen, you'll see in advertising as well, whether it's online, print, te television as well. There is a new aesthetic to all of the assets and the imagery, whether it's graphic design across Fisher Price. It's not just specific to product. So it's, it's, it's all important for us to, to really take the next step. We'll take uh, one more question. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, to the question, to the point earlier, um, in my I've got two kids, and I'm seeing uh, schools introduce uh, robotics really early in very simple, uh, kind of logic-based sets of instructions, um, and I'm amazed how much they love it. And mm -hmm. in a way, it seems to bridge this sort of touchpad thing with the kinetic. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you guys looked at that. Absolutely. It's something that I really can't talk about, but that's something that's on our radar, coding and, and all of the, the, how we make that accessible to a younger age, but it's definitely 
Stay tuned. It's, a, it's, it's coming. All right. I think, uh, sadly, we have to call it here, but that was, that was incredible. Thank you very Great. much. Great. Thank you.